Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. Um, I think I should really call this a Marmite talk because, um, like Marmite, uh, people either really like it or they really, really hate it. And I think the reason people feel passionate about it is because what I'm going to be talking about is something which is so personal to us, uh, namely the experience of this thing that we call the self. Now, defining the self is in itself a very difficult problem because the language we use is, is problematic. The idea of there being an object and a subject of self, again, is logically difficult to conceive of. But what I really want to address today is what is the common, uh, I think, perception of self. If you ask someone in the street about themselves, they will tell you a potted history and autobiography. They may tell you that they like certain things, or they might be able to describe their current phenomenological consciousness and experience in the present moment. And what I'm going to say is those uh, accounts of this, this individual, this character, this integrated, coherent entity um, is illusory. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, people misconceive or misinterpret, I think, the term illusion. What illusion really means is it's not what it seems. And what I'm hoping to convince you of this at this lunchtime is that this, this sense of the self is something which is constructed by our brains. So the first premise uh, is that the, the external world um, is simulated by our brains. There's no, we have no direct contact with reality. We're continually processing the information uh, through our senses, and we're storing this in our brain, and so we have... Uh, representations of the external world, and then we have representations that we store, that we bring to bear when we're thinking about and trying to understand the world around us. But we have no direct contact. Everything is filtered through this wonderful biological computer, the, the brain. So what do I mean by an illusion? Well, this is a very famous one. It's simple, but it's very sophisticated, in my opinion. It's the Kanitsa illusion. Now, if you look at this, you have this overwhelming, hopefully, impression that there's a white square sitting above the four circles. But, of course, there is nothing there at all. Um, now that's in the visual illusion, and now that I've told you that, you still see the square, and that in itself is an interesting point, that when you have insight into an illusion, it doesn't necessarily eradicate it. But here's something which I think is really quite interesting. If I was to go into your brain, to the visual processing area at the back of your brain, uh, I can find uh, these specialized cells that we'll talk about in a moment called the neurons. Now, neurons, um, they respond, and I can find neurons which are responding to edges of squares. But the interesting thing, the same neuron which responds to an edge would also respond to this illusory edge. So what that means is that the brain interprets this arrangement and comes up with a solution, that this must be a white square above four circles. And then, if you like, sends down information lower into the system saying there's an edge there, so fire as if it's really there. So the hallucination is, is, is to all intents and purposes, real. So I want you to watch carefully and tell me what you think this man is saying. Ba, 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 ba. Well, hands up if you've heard him say, da, 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 da. Great, and you probably would put money on that. Now, I'm going to play the same piece again, but close your eyes and listen carefully. Ba, 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 ba. Hands up if you heard ba, ba. Good, your hearing's perfect. He is actually saying Baba. Now, there is proof that your phenomenological experience cannot really be trusted. You have no direct contact with reality, okay? Your brain takes the auditory signal, which is Ba, and then we superimpose the visual signal of Ga. You have no representation of your brain for that, sh uh, for that sound and that vision, so your brain comes up with a solution, and that's constructed, okay? It's not real. Okay, so this is me. This really is me, actually. This is my brain from one of our studies. And everything I am, my fears, my anxieties, my humor, my uh, everything, my memories, is somehow stored and computed in this, this, this three-pound you know, three lump of tissue. But obviously, um, this thing, Bruce, I didn't pop out my, mo my mother's womb as Bruce. I had to become Bruce, didn't I? So I think there's something to be said uh, about development. How does the brain eventually become what we recognize as the individuals? Well. One way to think about it is to draw a distinction that William James did between the experience of I, which is the conscious phenomenology of who I am in the present moment, with me, which is the autobiography, the history of who I am. And so I would think it's quite plausible 
that very young infants may have conscious awareness. Well, I'm sure they do, in fact. So I think they've got the I experience, but they don't necessarily have the me experience, which is the history. So how do I and me become Bruce? Well, it must be something to do with the way that we store information and the networks which make up the, the kind of higher processing levels of the brain. These are the neurons. This is a diagram. And they're all connected up in this massive parallel system which are exchanging communication through these nerve impulses. And when the world imposes upon you, this sets up these chains of activation patterns, and these become stored. And it's these stored patterns or representations, representations, is basically the language of the brain. And you've got a lot of them, about 86 billion of them. Now, what might surprise you is that very young babies also have about 86 billion neurons. But what they lack is all the connections between the neurons. And it's the connections between the neurons which provides the, the immense processing power of the brain. What actually happens over experience is these, these connections become strengthened. This is driven by two processes. The brain is given biological information to simply sprout out all these connections. But the environment works to strengthen those which are stimulated. So if they're firing together, they're wiring together. And another kind of turn of phrase neurobiologists say, if you don't use them, you lose them. So in this way, the brain is becoming sculpted through the experiences of the early environments. This explains a number of interesting phenomenon. For example, we're very good at telling faces apart, uh, though not often when it comes to someone like Robin Ince, who's this more famous comedian. I'm often mistaken for him. And indeed, I've actually autographed his books, much to the annoyance of his fans. But we can tell faces apart very readily, unless they're from a different race. If we haven't been exposed to another race, we find it quite hard. That's why we say they all look alike. Um, we certainly find it harder to tell sort of monkey faces apart. But what might interest you is that if you take very young babies, they have no problem telling different race faces apart, or indeed they can tell the difference between monkeys quite easily. But with experience, they become tuned in to their environment. The environment is shaping the representations they have in their brain. So I've been talking about perception, but the talk today is really about the self. And so what we need to think about is what the brain does socially, because we're increasingly coming to understand that many of the sophisticated aspects of the brain are really all to do with something about getting on with each other. And I think one of the most interesting aspects about the social brain is I believe it must be shaped through this early experience of social interactions. We're all born with this uh, tendency to want to look after our young, to nurture them, because I don't think it's any coincidence, but humans have proportioned the longest period as infants in comparison to any other social animal. And it's not that we're just exchanging information or passing on knowledge from one generation to the next. I think this is a mechanism to make us become social. And if you raise them in isolation, we know from the work of Harry Harlow, this can have a detrimental effect. So it's not the fact they're not getting food or they're not being kept warm. Harlow demonstrated that if you raise them and nurture them, then rhesus monkeys will end up with profound problems of socialization. And the same thing happens with humans. So babies are born to be social from the start. We respond to them socially, and they respond back to us this way. They will cry. They have empathy. Uh, when they hear crying, they will cry themselves. They will seek to soothe and share. They will directly try to interact with adults to get a rise out of them. And in fact, that's what babies do. Anyone who works with young children and babies realizes that the focus of attention are not the toys, it's not the television, it's other humans. That's the most interesting thing to a baby. And of course, they grow into become toddlers. Now, I'm not suggesting that they just are pro-social or promiscuously social. They tend to be kind of a, they're focusing in on those individuals or those adults which are responding to them. Now, of course, um, as we develop over these early years, we're becoming individuals. We initially start off as being the focus of our parents' attention, but then we have to learn and change socially. We have to get on with siblings. We have to get on with peers. We're becoming part of the tribe. And this, is, this, is, this ability is subserved by various systems. So we can recognize who we are. This is a classic kind of rouge test. You know, but babies around about 18 months start to recognize the image as a reflection of themselves. This is an ability which is shared with other social animals, including uh, dolphins and, and elephants. They're developing what we call a theory of mind, which is this ability to imagine someone else's perspective, to be less egocentric. And this is really important, because if you want to kind of get on in a group and then manipulate others, you have to sort of understand or imagine what they may be thinking. But really what's important, and this is some, uh, something I think has been underestimated, is the importance that we put on other people's opinions of ourselves. I think children are increasingly becoming self-conscious over the middle childhood period to the point of adolescence where they're obsessed by what other people think about them. It's less what the parents think. It's more what their, um, their colleagues or their peers, I should say, are thinking.
So we're on this path to becoming adults, and we're mimicking, copying, integrating all the time. And then we're taking our lead from those around us. Initially, this may be our parents, but increasingly, as our social circles broaden, we have to take into consideration the other people in that group. Self-control is something that children have to learn. And remarkably, their ability for self-control predicts how they behave later as adults. For example, those who can delay gratification, as we say, turn out to be more socially competent. They're also much better at school. They perform better in school. They're less disruptive. And they're also emotionally more stable. In fact, um, their performance at four years predicts whether or not they become drug addicts later on in 20 years of time. So why is this important? Well, you know, if you think about the brain as a constellation of systems, and this is why I don't think there's any self as such, you have all these drives, all these motives, all these contexts, all these things trying to kind of take control, but they have to be regulated. If you're going to be socially responsible, you know you've got to control your aggression and all the other things, and that's what being antisocial is all about. And these are regulated by these sort of supervisory systems of the frontal parts of the brain, which, by the way, undergo major maturation around about three to four years of age. So you're regulating your behavior all the time. Now, who is this regulator? Is there somebody sitting in the frontal lobes which is controlling it? Is there a self operating this machine like some sort of captain of a, of a, of a ship? Well, no. And yet, I think that's what many of us experience or think. We feel we're in control of our bodies. We see our bodies as a vessel. We can see it aging in the mirror when we pass every year and look at ourselves. But we still feel that we're an integrated, coherent, uh, cohesive individual. And I would suggest that that is part of this illusion that the brain creates. Rather, I think this is probably a better way of thinking about the self. This is the numbskulls, for those who are old enough to remember this comic. Uh, and I'm not suggesting there's lots of little homunculi, but what I'm saying is that there are lots of slave systems, subsystems, which are working autonomously. And the output of those systems is somehow fed up and coordinated with the sense of the self. Now, we know this is true from the work of people like Zanaga and Roger Sperry, who were working with patients who, uh, they basically had epilepsy, and so they, one of the ways to treat that is to separate the two halves of the brain by cutting through the corpus callosum. And now you have a brain which is effectively in two halves. So in one of their studies, they got the patients to fixate on the center of the screen and projected two different words, the word key into the left visual field and the word key into the right field. Now, due to the way that the pathways cross over, the word in the left field is processed in the right side of the brain, and the word in the right field is processed in the left. And when asked to say, well, what do you see? Because language is on the left side, they simply said ring. But when asked to pick up the object from the table with their left hand, which is controlled by the right side of the brain, they picked up the key. Now, the interesting thing is that when they were asked to try and explain their actions, what Gazaniga found was that people would confabulate an account to make sense of it. They, they made up a story to make sense of this inconsistent information. We do this all the time. Here's a simple study. You can ask people which is the most attractive woman in this task, and then you point to one of them, and the experimenter can actually switch them over and give you the opposite card so you don't realize they've been surreptitiously switched. And when that happens, people tend to come up with an explanation of why they've chose that person. So they seem unaware that they've just actually had their choice switched. We have this compulsion to try and make sense of the inconsistencies. And I think this inconsistency explains cognitive dissonance. We have a story about who we are. We have this idea that we're a good person, or we've got a sense of humor, or we have some moral standing. And when we're confronted with circumstances which seem to conflate with that or con conflict with that, we'll reinterpret the circumstances to fit to maintain this consistency. I think it also explains some of the classic examples in social psychology where people uh, behave in ways which seem out of character of having a self. There's uh, Ashes conformity studies. Basically, if 11 people say black is white, you're likely to agree with them. There's the work of Milgram, I'm sure you're aware of this, that you know, most people think they wouldn't ever hurt or harm somebody to a great degree, but when the circumstances are right, people can find themselves indeed doing that. And then there's Zimbardo's work showing that if you just arbitrarily separate people into in-groups and out-groups, they behave badly against them. And of course, these experiments have real-world applications in many examples where people just do things which just seem so uncharacteristic. What's going to happen to the self with the new technologies? Because we're at a time in our evolution where we now have the capacity to extend ourself, to communicate ourself to a vast audience, never before in a two-way interaction. We think we're individuals on the web, but if you look at our behavior, this is an example as a plot of Twitter uh, communication, people segregate into these groups. Even though they feel they're individuals, they basically are forming around uh, collective ideas. I just want to end by saying that, um, when you ask people at the end of their lives, 
what is your last regret, or what, what do you regret the most? This is the analysis of, uh, from Bronnie Ware's work. The one thing that people say is they don't feel they ever lived a true self. So whilst we might deny the existence of self, I think we have this constant notion that we're being pooled by all the circumstances in our life, and we feel that we don't actually have the autonomous control. And I think we need to think about that autonomous control. I'm not suggesting that we're blank slates. Clearly, we inherit something from our parents. People have different personalities. Anyone who's raised children knows that if you treat them the same, they still end up as individuals. But it's that individuality within the social environment which I think shapes us. And if you take away all that contextual information, then I would argue that you could effectively lose your identity of who you are. Well, at one level, as, as, uh, as your book argues, in a sense, there is something kind of perverse about this trick that we play on ourselves. And um, we use phrases, very old phrases, like I said to myself, it's a fantastic, who is yeah. this conversation between? But um, why have we evolved to play this trick on ourselves? What is the evolutionary mm. advantage of this, of this, of this illusion? Well, just in the same way as the brain um, constructs the visual illusions or the auditory illusions or constructs um, perception, it's a very um, convenient way of abstracting the important information and producing an output which allows us to interact. We couldn't interact in a parallel system. We have to create this sort of individuals talking to individuals, and that enables or facilitates this interaction. And so I think it's a very useful way of actually just summarizing the multitude of influences which are actually playing into our decision processes and who we are. But, but this capacity to think about thinking, which we uniquely have, no other species have it. Well, we don't you, know that. <laughs> well, there's, as far as we can tell, no other species has the capacity to think about thinking. Other species have the capacity to think, but not to think about thinking. Mm. Uh, so it must therefore, I mean, the story of why it evolved in us and only us, and it evolved to such a degree in us and only us, it, it's, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of a puzzle. What, it, it must do some pretty powerful work for us. And I guess you'd say, well, that is reflected in the fact that you know, in culture and human progress mm. uh, and all those things. Do you think we yet understand fully the very beginnings of this? Why it evolved at the very, very first place? No, and I'd be speculating to say so. I mean, I think that what makes us very different, there are other social animals, and there are animals who have varying degrees. You know, for example, uh, I was saying some of the, the hallmarks on the, the emergence of self are things like self-recognition and uh, imitation, theory of mind. There's evidence that these all exist in a number of other social animals to varying degrees, but nothing to the extent that exists in humans. Now, that might just be because this is our niche, and therefore, why would you expect them to have these sorts of abilities? Nevertheless, I think that it's our capacity for communication, our capacity for social integration, and this extended childhood that we have all seem to be uh, candidates, in my opinion, as, as the, the factors which would require the evolution of a self-identity that is shaped by those around us. So I suppose, in answer, to, if I was to speculate, I think it's the consequence of us becoming this kind of super social species that needs the self.